makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Stronger than expected wage growth in the UK reinforces the Bank of England's caution against moving too quickly to cut rates. In the US, members of the Federal Reserve say they're looking for broader disinflation to signal rate cuts. The latest CPI report due in a few hours. Plus, President Biden pushes for a six-week pause in fighting in Gaza as Israel launches more strikes on the crowded southern city of Rafah. Now, let's take a look at the European markets map. Again, European stocks, but also U.S. equity futures, I think, finding their feet a little bit. Um, they posted some small moves in a pretty cautious trading environment. And this is before the release of this very keenly awaited inflation data that could provide clues on the timing of the Federal Reserve interest rate cut. Now, I'm looking at auto stocks. They're actually on the rise in Europe overall. Uh, Michelin rallied after the time maker's earnings and share buyback announcement. And then a couple of other things that we're looking at is, for example, oil after the big move in the last couple of days. Then pound strengthening after UK wage growth slowed less than expected in the fourth quarter. Again, this may underscore um, the Bank of England's caution against moving too quickly to cut interest rates. Unemployment ticked down to 3.8 percent. Now joining us to talk about the UK and then we talk about U.S. inflation and Andrade from Bloomberg Economics. And I thank you so much for joining us. I mean, the Bank of England does not have it easy and I feel like they haven't had it easy for quite some time. Can you, can you break down the data for us and what this actually means for the BOE? Yes, sure. So today we got a surprise reading on the wage growth, which is actually the most important data detail in the release. Mm -hmm. It came in, it had been falling fast, so that would have been good news for the BOE, uh, but it came in, uh, it fell to 6.2% in the last three months of the year, and we and the Bank of England were expecting it to fall to 6%. Now, that obviously lifts the risk that the BOE acts a little bit later than we expect. We, our base case was that they were going to cut rates mm -hmm. by May, uh, but for the time being, we're sticking to our view yeah. and the reason for that is because we essentially think that out, out of all the data that's coming over the next week and over the next month the most important one is inflation because right. essentially if you get headline inflation down that feeds through lower inflation expectations and that that will feed yeah. through to lower pay demands so, and we get cpi tomorrow i guess the, the, the concern for the bank of england and we were following that you know decision last time with the press conference is that we also don't know when on march the 6th the chancellor comes up within his budget and that could could have you know inflationary pulses no, definitely. I mean, what the inflationary policies of the budget will largely depend on the sort of tax cuts yeah. <coughs> sorry, that we get. Um, because as we've seen in the previous budget, what we saw was like some, a, a, a big chunk of tax cuts, but because they also stimulated labor supply, then they no. weren't so inflationary. So that's what the BOE will be looking for. But now with inflation coming in tomorrow and ahead, I mean, tomorrow we're going to get a slight tick up in inflation, mm -hmm. which will be sort of an awkward reading. But what matters is what inflation does next. And until May, we still have three readings of inflation. If it comes in line as we expect, that means that headline inflation will be undershooting the 2% from spring. And that should, you know, should give the BOE enough reason to start easing its policy a bit. And I think so much, Anne Andrade, there from Bloomberg Economics. Now, we're also joined by Grace Peters, Global Head of Investment Strategy at JP Morgan Private Bank. This is a big day, Grace, for the market, so I love having you on. We talk about everything from, like, you know, what the UK does to, um, to the Fed. In general, is, is the, I don't know whether the question is, what, you know, if inflation's coming down enough for, to, for, for the central banks to start cutting, or whether the question should be, how difficult is that last mile going to be to, to get inflation under control? So we think that there's clear disinflation trends, and that is going to continue. I mean, the wage picture is certainly a part of it and a part that needs to be watched closely, whether it's in the UK and, of course, thinking back to the jobs data that we got out of the, the US. Now, US wages you know, had come down to that 4.2, 4.3% range if we think about average hourly earnings. We got that tick up to 45 which is a bit concerning. But again, that could just be part of the, you know, the January data blips that we've had in the last four years. So disinflation, we think, is here to stay. And as an example of that, I was really encouraged to see overnight the New York Fed um, consumer inflation expectations yeah. that, that showed over three years, consumers still think inflation is falling quite significantly. But great. How much of a mismatch is that with that, you know, incredible employment figures that we had? Yes. 
It's certainly a key part to watch. I don't think one data point makes a trend at this stage, and the broader body of data still supports disinflation. We're expecting core PC at 2 to 2.5% two by the end of the year, and we still feel really comfortable with that. The other elements that we're going to be watching within the print later is going to be goods price inflation. Mm -hmm. We've obviously seen disinflation driven by both goods and services. And whilst it's a little bit early, we still want to make sure that when we think about events in the Red Sea, you know, some of those delays shipping that that's not feeding through it's probably a bit early but still watching goods price inflation services obviously wages feed into that shelter as well but on balance disinflation I would say Francine though that despite expecting you know CPI to print below 3% uh, later, um, we still think that the market is over exuberant when it comes to when that first cut okay. comes in. Um, so our base case and has been for a while is that it's June that we get the first cut from the Fed and we'd view that as a good thing. We don't need to push the Fed, you know, sort of to move too soon. We think they're doing the right thing by waiting until, you know, you've got, you've got a, a firm body of data. So, Grace, it's a danger if they go too soon that then they have to reverse it. I think that's I think. right. And, and that would be a real, um, you know, negative for the market, I think. Rather just, you know, wait an extra couple of months to get the data that you need to, once you start cutting, you're definitively on that path, rather than have to cut, then pause and raise. So I would rather see them, you know, hold out until, until June or, or, or when the data justifies that. And do you think the Fed has to cut first? I mean, this is like kind of like a no, debate. I, I, I think it might be the ECB, actually. In our They'd be brave part. enough? <laughs> well, I think the data is, is significantly weaker. Like, when we look Look at all the data coming in from the US. I mean, even if we just think about GDP, consensus is expecting Q1 GDP to fade to around 2.5% for the US. But the now cast data implies it still starts with a three. So all the data in the US is coming in stronger. Um, and in Europe, it's, you know, hovering around zero. So, you know, it, we've, we've, in, our, in our official forecast, we've got June for both the Fed and the ECB, a little bit later, actually, for the Bank of England, because of the wages and, and the inflation situation. But if I had to say who was more likely to go before the baseline of June, it would be the ECB. And so, Grace, what does it mean on how you play the markets? I know, you, you know, we've talked about credit uh, before, but d yes. does, has, it, has your view changed in the last couple of so weeks? I'm Views haven't changed. I mean, equities have, have, have really been where our focus has been. Over we were we were sort of bullish last year, we're bullish this yeah. year. But I will say, having sort of increasingly taken our price target up for the S and P, okay. it's at five thousand one hundred. So the active debate now is, you know, do we take it up to our bull case, which would be five thousand three hundred? We feel comfortable holding with the current scenario at the moment. Um, we were waiting for third quarter earnings, and we're really happy with what we've seen there from the Magnificent Seven, but also from other parts of the economy. And, and that applies to Europe as well as to the US. Some really strong results out of Europe, um, particularly in sectors that the market had got concerned about, like luxury goods, fears over the China slowdown. We got some really good um, numbers out of that sector. Um, and so our sense is, you know, it doesn't matter too much whether the Fed yeah. cuts in June a month here, a month there. Yeah. The underlying earnings picture is pretty strong, driven by that economic and consumer resilience. Grace, earnings was a little bit funny in certain cases. That yeah, I feel like there were sectors where it, it was really, you know, a tale of two halves. It was companies that were beating expectations and others that weren't. Does it mean that it's a little bit of a crowded space within sectors? Well, I think the, the, the trade that everybody feels is crowded is, is technology Tech. and specifically yeah. the Magnificent yeah. Seven. But we saw some of the strongest yeah. beats out of that group. Maybe not all seven of them, but, but yeah. for, as, a, as a, in aggregate, um, you had over an 80% beat rate for that group versus 70% you know, broadly for the market overall. Um, and I actually think there's too much focus put on the sort of the concentration risk of that group. Um, earnings growth is far superior. So we're looking for about 25% earnings growth from the Magnificent mm -hmm. Seven versus you know high single digits from the rest of the market that's for 2024 but even in 2025 earnings growth will be higher it's cash flow I mean share buybacks will be a big driver of the market and you know large cap tech are yeah, and we've seen that half. Yeah. exactly some positive surprises on dividend announcements as well as share buybacks through earnings so I don't want to sort of create the impression that that's the only story in town I think there's more than just yeah. artificial intelligence security is another big theme um, for us um, but I wouldn't get overly hung up just on the concentration risk, it's earnings and cash flow that we feel pretty optimistic about. Um, I need to talk to, to you about commercial real estate, but maybe we'll do it in a couple of minutes. Ha, ha, what have we learned about China? Again, a, a lot of policy support, unclear ha, how far policymakers maybe want to go. Yeah, I think there's, we see two broad issues in China. One, one is, you know, 
outright disinflation, uh, so, so which is obviously at odds with um, the, the, the developed world, the rest of the developed world. Um, and the other is, is the property sector that needs more than what we've seen so far um, to really kickstart it. So, you know, I think helpful steps. Certainly it feels like, you know, a line is being drawn under the equity market. But as to whether this could lead to a sustained rally, um, we actually prefer within emerging markets to look elsewhere. So India is our preferred um, market um, because you see a very tight correlation between the GDP delivered yeah. by India and the earnings growth delivered by the region. And, and, and that's what we want to invest in. Okay, so interesting. We'll maybe talk a little bit more about uh, India next. To staying with us, Grace Peters from JP Morgan Private Bank. Now, much more to come. This is Bloomberg. I think it's too soon to have an expectation that, or to, to measure or project when and how much I think we might be lowering the policy rate. I think the progress that we're making on inflation is, um, is very um, positive. As long as we have continued progress at the current policy rate, I think at some point it will be appropriate for us to lower um, the federal funds rate. I don't see that in the immediate future. And I don't want to prejudge what our decisions might be uh, going forward this year. Well, that was the Fed Governor Michelle Bowman basically saying that it's too soon to know when or by how much Fed officials will cut rates. Uh, she basically also said that she does not see rate cuts as appropriate in the immediate future. Now, still with us, Grace Peters, Global Head of Investment Strategy at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. And Grace, you're expecting actually the first uh, rate cut from the Fed in June, which is a little bit of an outlier call. Uh, going back to, you know, what Fed cuts meet for emerging markets, what we've learned from emerging markets, certainly looking at earnings and also the sales of luxury, like, are, are they stronger than we expect? Did. Yeah, so I think you know, as an investor, when you're thinking of investing outside of the US and specifically into emerging markets, you want to know that you've got superior growth, you know, the EMDM growth premium, um, because there does come often more volatility and more risk. Um, and so when we think about which emerging markets are delivering growth that you as an equity investor can then capture through corporate earnings, you know, a shareholder friendly environment. India to us is top of the list. And so when we're thinking about a region that's still quite early in its you know, economic development, you're still seeing growth rates, GDP growth rate, six, seven percent. Um, and we look at the correlations between that GDP um, and the earnings growth, India does stand out to us. Now the pushback is always isn't that in the price? It's expensive. Um, but I think that that is the case for many of these, you know, growth type areas when it's quality growth um, and that that shouldn't necessarily be a prohibit uh, to, to investing. Just like you don't buy something just because it's cheap, you shouldn't not right. invest just because it's expensive. But so do you break it down by, by sectors? So, I, you know, there's also a lot of infrastructure that of money that, that will have to go into India. Is it the, the telecoms the yes. roads or do you play it through fixed income? I think No, I'd play it through the equity market. And I think infrastructure is one part of the story. Yeah. I think the consumer is another part of the story. When we think about the huge rise um, in the emerging middle class, you know, the story that we used to talk about for China for many years, we can apply a lot of that to India as well. We know that this is a young, dynamic, educated, um, tech-savvy workforce um, and you know the growing middle class I think you know going back to the luxury goods conversation we were um, having as well there's huge potential mm -hmm. for brands to grow in India as well as obviously the, the, the rise of the domestic um, brands there as well so I think it's quite a broad church of options when you invest in the region is, is, do you choose I mean, how do you choose actually between the domestic ones to the, the international ones that can get a bigger footprint in, in emerging markets so it also sort of depends a little bit on what you're trying to achieve from a geographic exposure but one very clear way to invest in emerging markets if you don't want to go in the region is to invest in Europe. When we think about, um, you know, one of the key advantages of investing in European companies, and we talk about European national champions, businesses that are yeah. listed here but actually sell the majority um, of, of their revenues are outside. Um, you know, luxury is one part, but also you can invest in materials, you can invest in industrials. Um, and so all of that's appealing. So you can do it through Europe, through the developed uh, market, um, or you can go in, and I, I, you know, I would be more selective with an active yeah. manager if you go into yeah. uh, in India um, as a region, but, but 
we think that there's a lot of potential there. So interesting, Grace. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was Grace Peters, Global Head of Investment Strategy at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Coming up, we discuss, we discuss the stock market frenzy for artificial intelligence with Shmuel Shafetz, founder and chairman of the VC firm Target Global. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Shares are lower in U.S. pre-market. Overall, the chip designer, though, has almost doubled in market value since last week. Now, that's after the British company made the case for how it will benefit from the artificial intelligence boom. The rally has also lifted shares in SoftBank, which owns around 90 percent of ARM. Now, let's discuss the future of AI with Shmuel Chaffetz, founder and partner of the venture capital firm Target Group. It's invested in more than 100 tech firms, including the fintech company Revolut. Shmuel, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, if thank you look you at the magnific Magnificent Seven, that I can never pronounce. It's incredible how much of a lift they have because they're associated with AI. The companies that are less AI focused, maybe Tesla, are, are not rallying as much. Are, are we overdoing it? I think it's, so first of all, I think it's very easy to uh, overestimate the short term impact of AI, but to grossly underestimate the long term impact. Um, it's, for the first time, I think in, the, in software, we're seeing a, a real shift in technology that's happening from within big firms, not within startups. So you see that, that the, the LLMs that are, are built within the big companies, and I'm including uh, OpenAI, which is basically today a subsidiary of Microsoft, yeah. um, are leading innovation. Yeah. So, I, so I actually don't think it's overstated. I think th these companies will have um, a disproportionate piece yeah. of this new market. And, and just were, so they, they can see a lot of lift in their core businesses. So what, what does it mean for how you invest? Because it, it must be more difficult. Like, do, do you invest in, you know, companies that could then be acquired by the big ones or add something? Like, the, the investing landscape is changing quite significantly. It is changing. I think we're, first of all, we're investing less. We're investing less right now. Yeah. I think a lot of people are investing less. Yeah. Um, we understand that uh, 24 is going to be um, a year where the shift is going to start to really hit the market. Yeah. And, and I think for us as venture investors, we have to, to take a, a pause for a minute, try to understand how the market changes, yeah. and try to, to adjust ourselves. Because I think the old model of venture investing yeah. is in software particularly is just not yeah. going to work anymore. It's, it's, because, it's because what? Because the big companies will dominate that space with internal funding? First of all, but, and, and they have enormous amounts of capital, right? From shareholder equity to, so have, and to just cash, enormous cash flow that they can buy with, but they can also build. Um, but also because a small group of people working on one of those platforms can build what hundreds of engineers used to build. So we're seeing companies that had tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, venture money invested in them get challenged by six people in, in a garage. It's almost a throwback to the 90s, right, where enterprise software companies started to get hit by 90s, early 2000s by these younger startups. So it's just going to take the, it's going to shift from engineering as the mm -hmm. core mm -hmm. to um, customer experience, business development, yeah. and more than anything, data. The access yeah. to good data sets is going to matter more than anything, and that's going to be the differentiator. But how do you look for bubbles? So I remember, you know, early 2000s where even some of the big banks were like bigbank.com, and now it's like big bank AI. H how do you, you know, separate the real value plays to the rest? That's a great question. I, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> would have made my uh, 22 much better after uh, grade 21. But um, look, I think in the end, we know to recognize when someone has a real tech dividend. Yeah. So. In the end, AI is going to be ubiquitous. Yeah. The, whole, the whole software world is going to be operated on generative artificial intelligence. So everybody's going to benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, we obviously have to be careful from the FOMO effect and yeah. from, from chasing after something that, that clearly has no product market fit yet mm -hmm. and is completely disattached from any economic realities, right? Yeah. And, and that's, we're starting to see it in some places in this market. It doesn't mean, by the way, I think we saw all these banks being bank.com, and all the banks today are basically tech companies and internet companies, right? They're all, they all have great services. So they did make the shift. Um, and all the companies that are talking about, a lot of companies that are talking about AI, it will yeah. take time for them to actually get something out of it, but I think a lot of them will end up uh, getting a lot of uh, benefit.
Uh, I know Target Global was also in the news because of links to Abramovich and Russia. H has that impacted the way you do business? So we, we did have, uh, like I think almost any other firm in Europe, uh, money from uh, Russians before before the war, uh, before the invasion. Um, when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, we obviously severed those ties. And one of my partners, Alex, one of my co-founders, left the firm voluntarily to protect uh, our portfolio companies. And uh, that's that's unfortunate, but uh, it was had to be done. Uh, how's I mean, how's funding in general? A tough environment. It's a tough environment, yeah. and I think it's it's justifiably tough, right? I think again, it's it's hard to invest today when uh, the future is so yeah. unpredictable. Yeah. But I think this year is going to be a year of shift and yeah. 25, 26, 27, I think we'll see a better year. And by the way, it's regardless of rate cuts and macro. I just think there's so much opportunity around AI that once we find the right tack, the industry will start to, to sort of bounce back. Shmuel, thank you so much for joining us today. That was Shmuel uh, Chaffetz, founder and partner of Target Global. Coming up, we preview the latest U.S. CPI report, which is due in a few hours. We'll also have more. From our interview, the U.S. Republican candidate, Nikki Haley. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Stronger than expected wage growth in the UK reinforces the Bank of England's caution against moving too quickly to cut rates. In the US, members of the Federal Reserve say they are looking for broader disinflation to signal rate cuts. The latest CPI report is due in a few hours. Plus, President Biden pushes for a six week pause in fighting in Gaza as Israel launches more strikes on the crowded southern city of Rafah. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So markets eagerly awaiting the latest U.S. CPI reading later to confirm the view that the Fed has brought inflation back under control. Now, economists predict the headline CPI will come in below 3 percent for the first time in nearly three years. Well, joining us now is our MLife strategist, Ven Ram and Sofia Ortega Costa from Bloomberg Markets Today blog. So thank you both uh, for joining us. Ven, let's start with you. What are you expecting from this inflation report? And actually, will it, will it be enough for markets to, to be convinced either way of what happens next for the Fed. Morning, Francine. I think I'll be looking out most crucially for the core inflation data. As you know, uh, it's expected to come in at 3.7 percent, so almost 4 percent. And that is hardly a number that is going to give the Fed any confidence that inflation is under control now. As you mentioned just now, they are looking for a, a broader parameters that inflation is coming, is coming off the boil. Now, independently of that, the markets think that there is a fair chance that we will get a rate cut in May. I think June is more likely. Why do I say that? Because the Fed, as you know, has penciled in three rate cuts this year. And if they go in June, there will be four other meetings in which to seek two rate cuts, which means they go in alternative months. And that would work out just perfectly fine. But if they were to cut rates in May, that would meddle the messaging because they would have five more rate meetings in the remainder of the year in which to get through two, high, two cuts. And that would be an awfully complicated messaging to say, mm. oh, we will cut randomly in September or in November or whatever. So I think that market should be positioned more for a June rate cut. Mm -hmm. And Sophia, how does this play out? Again, if you look at some of the Treasury gains that you know have been a little bit short lived, there's a lot of market kind of anxiousness about what happens next. A lot of this is already priced in the cuts. It is. And I, I do think if we zoom out a little bit, um, you know, will this actually change the narrative for for markets and for the Fed? Markets tend to think in hours in days. Right. And they try to price things in. Um, and and we, what we have seen lately is a kind of a, a big reaction uh, to U.S. data and then things settle and, you know, markets carry on as they were. So uh, will this really change the narrative? I think, you know, for it would need to be a very, very big surprise in either way. What we're seeing, Fran, there was a huge uh, gap 
between what the Fed was saying and what markets were expecting the Fed to do, we're seeing that gap narrow. It, it does seem that markets are kind of growing more comfortable with perhaps a later than expected cut from the Fed. Uh, you know, what, what Ven was saying, maybe June um, is more likely. Uh, that's what markets may perhaps um, have to get to grips with. Um, but again, the, the messaging from the Fed has been very clear. It's unclear, though, you know, whether waiting too long will give them the information they need. So there's a balancing act there as well, Fran. Yeah, and will it, Then I mean, this is a very good point, is that if they wait a little bit longer, is, you know, do they protect themselves against everyone's worst concern, which is that they kind of then have to, to rise quite quickly? Yeah, I think that... Um it, it would be too premature for them to cut any sooner because, you know, they are mindful of what happened in the 70s and 80s because at that point, the Fed was keen to cut rates and they did cut rates and then that restoked inflation all over. And this Fed under Powell is acutely mindful of the risks surrounding a resurfacing and reacceleration of inflation, which is why they want to see inflation broaden, disinflation broaden out. And as Neil Kashkari said the other day, they want more good inflation prints rather than just going right now and cutting rates imminently. After all, the economy has proved extremely resilient. Demand is still good. The labor market pressures are still strong. So there is no incentive for the Fed to go in just, now, just yet. And I guess, if you, you know, the question on the markets is why, why was the jobs number so strong? Yeah. And until we figure that out, it's going to be very difficult to, for the Fed, I guess, to, to do anything too decisively. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and to Ven's point, you know, wh why would the Fed need to cut, right? Yeah. I think that messaging needs to be very carefully uh, calibrated because if it's cutting because it, it sees that the inflation flight, fight is over, then it needs to be very uh, sure of that, right? But if it's, it doesn't need to cut, and we have policy uh, this restrictive and the economy is still okay, the jobs market is still okay, you're still seeing strong domestic demand, then why would the Fed need to cut in the first place? You know, it does have the luxury of time, which is something that maybe policymakers here in the UK and in Europe don't have, where they do, they are seeing pockets of weakness in the economy and they do need to move a, bit, a little bit faster. Um, ben, do you think the ECB goes first in terms of cuts? I think that the ECB is going to go in June. I think I still believe what uh, Christine Lagarde told you in the Davos interview. I still stand by that. And I think that, you know, markets are a bit premature in pricing an April rate cut. I think June is more likely to happen and definitely likely to happen. I, I know you have a great piece, of course, on what guilds could do. I, it, ben, it doesn't feel great, I guess, be, being the Bank of England governor, because you have all the pressures of the central banks with, you know, the, that extra layer of uncertainty. Absolutely. I think the Bank of England is caught between a rock and a hard place, as Sophia was saying. You know, there are pockets of economic weakness. But at the same time, if you look at wage pressures today, I mean, that, those numbers are not going to give the BOE any confidence that, you know, price formation and wage settings are conducive to a rate cut just yet. We have got services inflation, which is supposed to accelerate to almost 7% in January. And we just got the wage data this morning. If you take those two together, it's very hard to conclude that headline inflation is going to crumble to 2% anytime soon. And that is bound to keep the Bank of England pretty wary. Yeah, and Sophia, I like Ven's piece today saying, look, you know, the Bank of England pricing centered around June looks a, a little bit tenuous. Are we going to see more swings in pound or gills than anything else? Because, again, it's a little bit more fluid maybe than other places. It is. And actually, we tend to look at the pound versus the dollar. But I think the interesting movement is in the pound euro. And, and the pound actually strengthened to the the highest uh, in six months versus the euro uh, today. And you're, that's really kind of um, the market saying, we, you know, we do think that the BOE is what Ven, how Ven describes it, between a, a rock and a hard place where it's still fighting the inflation fight, but at the same time it's grappling with pockets of weakness in economic growth. The ECB doesn't really have that much of a yeah. problem, especially when it comes to fighting inflation. But I think, you know, uh, some, some, uh, some of Wall Street is actually saying the pound is a good bet, but mm -hmm. expect more volatility. Uh, in the months ahead, especially as we get this data feeding in, Fran. Um, Sophia, you're also a great China watcher. I know there's Lunar New Year, so for the moment there's a couple of days off. But actually, what are you watching out for in the Chinese economy in the next couple of, of weeks? I mean, commercial real estate, yes. Take. Anything yes. else? <laughs> Tick. Well, actually, the Lunar New Year period tends to be a, a quite a key uh, consumer spending period. So watching out for any data on cinema ticket sales, on travel, 
uh, on restaurant spending. Uh, you know, the consumer story is a very important story for policymakers in Beijing. But also, let's see how the market has digested uh, those capital market support measures and the new securities regulator announced just before the holiday. Um, you know, whether the market is actually more convinced that that will um, make a difference at all, whether there'll be more forceful measures to support the stock market, which has been an incredible underperformer this year. Um, but in terms of economic signals, you know, whether the consumer story is working or not, I think there's risks, still risks there, and any communication from Xi Jinping's government uh, on plans to support that will be keenly watched as well. Uh, Sophia and Ven, thank you so much for joining us. Bloomberg, Sophia Ortaik Cost and our M Live strategist, Ven Ram. Now, coming up, President Biden pushes for a six-week pause in fighting in Gaza as Israel launches more strikes on the crowded southern city of Rafah. That story is at next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back and let's turn to developments in the Middle East. U.S. President Joe Biden is pushing for a plan to pause fighting in the Israel-Hamas war in order to free hostages. Now, Joe Biden spoke following a meeting with Jordan's king at the White House and said those conditions could lay the groundwork for broader peace. As the king and I discussed today, the United States is working on a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, <clears throat> which would bring an immediate and sustained period of calm to Gaza for at least six weeks. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. Ros, thank you for joining us. So what are the, the key uh, difficult points in getting a proper ceasefire? Well, there's two main sticking points in all of this, and the overarching one is really what would happen after a short-term ceasefire is the understanding that this paves the way for a permanent ceasefire. Um, secondly, of course, is what happens to the Israeli troops in the meantime. Are they agree that they'll pull out of the Gaza Strip entirely, or do they do a partial withdrawal to different parts of the Gaza Strip? And those are two real sticking points in all of this. Of course, Israel says it cannot agree to a permanent ceasefire um, as part of this because their overarching goal is to eradicate Hamas, and they've not achieved that. And Hamas says, well, of course, we can't have Israeli troops still hanging around in the Gaza Strip uh, for the long term. And so these are two real problems in these arrangements. Of course, we know there's multiple plans going around, multiple conversations going on. There's another meeting today uh, involving Qatar and Egypt to try and facilitate this. Um, but certainly it seems that those two sticking points remain pretty severe. So is time running out to get a ceasefire given Israel is so determined to push ahead with a ground offensive in Rafah? Well, that is the real impetus to try and get something fairly soon because the Israeli government has made clear that they plan to launch a ground offensive uh, in Rafa, which is that very bunched up area near the Egyptian border. There's estimates of over a million people there at the moment uh, in refugee camps and, and sort of cordoned off in that area. And the question is, where do they go if there's an Israeli ground offensive there? They can't go into Egypt because Egypt won't let them in. Can they go further north in the Gaza Strip? That's very difficult. And so they're racing against time to try and ward that off by agreeing on a ceasefire because it's very clear that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu intends to do that fairly soon. As he said, again, his goal is to eradicate Hamas. And he says that there are Hamas enclaves around the Rafah area. So it really is that race against time that we've talked about. Uh, Roz, how bad has the relationship gotten between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, it's clear there's a lot of tension going on there, both increasingly publicly and no doubt very much behind the scenes. There's lots of reports unverified of the exasperation that Joe Biden is expressing to his aides, to officials in the White House, that, uh, that Netanyahu is simply not listening to him. And that's very clear that Netanyahu thinks he's going to charge his own course here. And that's despite you know, the U.S. being the major military and strategic ally for Israel in the region and also a major partner economically, that Netanyahu says, well, I'm doing this for Israel, and that's it. But it's quite, you know, telling. It exposes the limits of U.S. influence over Israel, and that's not particularly a good look for Joe Biden in an election year in the U.S. when he needs to look like he's commanding and in control. Um, the question is, does that spill over increasingly into the public sphere, and what does it do in the long term for the relationship between U.S. and Israel? It does seem that it's on a projected downturn in ties for, this, for at least the foreseeable future.
Ross, thank you so much. As always, our news director for EMEA there, Ross Matheson. Now, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley has told Bloomberg Surveillance it was a mistake for the former U.S. President Donald Trump to say he would abandon NATO members to a Russian incursion if allies failed to meet their defense spending commitments. This is a man who has wanted to destroy America and defeat America for years. I dealt with Russia every single day. It is a mistake for Trump to side with Putin over our allies. We needed a lot of friends after 9-11. We better remember that. But it takes a friend to, to get a friend. Ambassador Haley, I'm sure you've seen the comments from the likes of Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio. When it comes to NATO, do you feel like you're potentially at a step with members of your own party? You know, it's not, the goal is never to follow the polls. The goal is to make sure you, you communicate what's right. We need to make sure that we have an alliance that's strong. Our whole goal is to prevent war. That's the main thing. I mean, you look at Russia right now. The reason people should care about Ukraine is because, one, it's a pro-American, freedom-loving country. But, two, listen to what Putin said. Putin said once he takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries. That immediately puts America at war. This is about preventing war. This is about keeping an alliance strong. This is about bringing more friends in, not pushing friends away. Donald Trump doesn't get that. And that's what will creep us into war. We can't have that. And so our goal is not to go and blame the American people for feeling the way they do. It's to make sure we get our message out on why they should care and how this is in the best interest of America. And for those politicians who are refusing to say that, that's a disservice to the people that they serve. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley there is speaking with Anne-Marie Hordern. Now to Germany now and Christian Lindner, the German finance minister, told us exclusively in a conversation that the country's economy can turn around if the correct reforms are put in place. Germany has some uh, structural deficits and uh, these deficits um, had been covered by low interest rates, by demand from the global markets and well the very cheap uh, fossil energy which we uh, imported from Russia. And now this uh, situation has changed and uh, the German economy um, has uh, to to um, find um, a new basis. Um, and um, I think there is potential for uh, a fast turnaround, mm -hmm. uh, given uh, the uh, human capital, the intellectual property, the substance of our economy. Mm -hmm. But uh, since the uh, circumstances uh, have changed, we have to improve the, the framework conditions mm -hmm. for our businesses, mm -hmm. which means reforms for the labor market, yep. uh, which means uh, less uh, red tape. Yep. We need investments in the uh, public infrastructure and the uh, digitalization yep. of uh, our public uh, administration. And of course, um, I think we need a reform of our corporate uh, tax system. That was Christian Lindner, the German finance minister, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Coming up, how the protests of EU farmers have rippled across the world in a hugely important year for elections. That story is next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, in recent months, farmers across Europe have taken to the streets protesting tax increases, regulation and bureaucracy. Now, in a year of elections, agriculture has increasingly become a key battleground in a global culture war over money, food and climate change. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook reports. The farmers have had it. They've taken to the streets across Europe, protesting cuts to tax breaks, competition from cheaper imports, onerous environmental regulations and sprawling bureaucracy. The spark came from Germany, where the government rolled back agricultural diesel subsidies. If that sounds familiar, that's because in 2018 it was a seemingly innocuous fuel tax that unleashed the gilets jaunes across France. France is the biggest agricultural producer in Europe, worth about 100 billion euros every year, but still imports about 50% of its fruits and vegetables. In Germany, agriculture employs less than a million people, but it accounts for more than half of the nation's land use. Across the board, though, in GDP terms, agriculture is minuscule. 
but in very real terms, what is more important than feeding your population? Plus, issues from climate change to the war in Ukraine have highlighted the importance of local food security. In Germany, a partial backtrack by the government wasn't enough. Nor in France. Even the EU has had to flinch. What makes it even harder for politicians is the overwhelming support for farmers by the broader population. Agriculture benefits from huge subsidies. About a third of the whole EU budget goes to farmers to the tune of about 55 billion euros in 2021. Plus, German farmers enjoyed record-breaking revenue last year. But when you speak to them, it's not just about money. There's also an impression. An impression that lofty climate and trade goals are being issued by lawmakers far from the soil that grows the food that sustains them, and an impression which anti-establishment politicians hope to harvest in a year rich with elections. Well, that was Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. Now, joining us for more on the story is Bloomberg's Lubov Pernina in Brussels. Lubov, so good to speak to you. So why are farmers protesting? What are the main reasons? Well, there are different reasons which are particular to each country where we see farmers protest. For example, if we take Germany, it's plans to cut diesel subsidies. If we take the Netherlands, these are plans to curb nitrogen pollution. And most recently, last Friday, a Polish farmers announced a one-month-long uh, protest, and they are protesting uh, what they say is an uncontrolled uh, influx of uh, Ukrainian grain, Ukrainian agriculture products. But there are obviously reasons that um, work for all other farmers as well. And what are they? Uh, these are increasing production costs, increasing administrative burden, also increasing legislation uh, Europe-wide, which is becoming more stringent. And uh, farmers um, uh, see that it, it is really complicating their life. Uh, and also competition from other countries which happen to be thousands of miles away from European Union, yet their products come over at a cheaper price and they probably don't have to go through the same stringent uh, check procedures uh, than in Europe. And uh, more general, what farmers have been mentioned is uh, their lack of acknowledgement, uh, the lack of respect for the work that they do. And um, acknowledgement and respect is actually something that European leaders have been mentioning quite a lot recently as they're trying to address this growing mm. discontent in the year of uh, elections across the world. So, Lubov, what does this mean for the elections in many countries this year? Well, we have a very um, packed uh, election schedule this year with uh, 40 countries, uh, countries uh, that account for 41% 40, of um, world population and 42% of GDP. And when we look at numbers, when it comes to farming, it accounts to less uh, than 2% of GDP in Europe or 1% in the US. And in terms of workforce in Europe, it's just over 4%. Uh, not much would you say, but then when you see hundreds of tractors blocking highways across Europe, it's very visible and people notice and people support farmers and um, leaders simply uh, can't ignore this. They have uh, to uh, react and they have been reacting in, um, in different countries, uh, rolling back uh, legislations and their proposals, uh, something that we've seen in France, for example, promises of more financial support uh, and uh, more checks uh, on products coming from uh, third countries. And there are some uh, opposition leaders who yep. want to harness this process. Lubov, thank you so much for a great recap on some of the challenges ahead, Lubov Pernina. Now, very quickly, let's also look at what Man United is doing pre-market after Jim Ratcliffe extended his previously announced tender offer to buy up to 13.2 million Manchester United shares to the end of February 16th. Of course, uh, the well, Bloomberg continues with a full roundup of market news. This is Bloomberg.